and sisters, to your house of prayer. It's good to see you all. Kind of a goofy sermon title, isn't it? <laughs> well, I like to pick a sermon title like that. Are you a bright light in a night fight? Only Ray um, Turning our Bibles over to Romans chapter 6, one page over. Knowing this, this is 6-6, six, six. knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's turn our Bibles to, we're going we're to study a little bit real long about a man named Job. All right, if you go, if you find, if you find Psalms, everybody knows where Psalms is. There's one book left of Psalms. Okay? You'll find that little book of Job. And this poor little fellow, Job, y'all know the story of Job. We're going to turn to uh, chapter 32. In my opinion, Job was a very good advance. Okay? There wasn't an advance on the planet yet. <laughs> he was a very good advance. He knew the law, and he obeyed, didn't he? And we have this scene in heaven, right, where um, the sons of God, it say, come before him to testify of their worlds and whatnot's going on. And, and Satan... He represents the earth. So he comes. Right? And God says to him, he says, well, where do you come from? He says, well, I come from going to and fro in the earth and roaming around it. And God says, well, have you seen my servant Job? There's none like him in the earth. It's a good advance. He does all this stuff real well. So, the devil says, well, you was to take away all that stuff that he has, he would curse you to your face. You blessed him. You put a hedge around him. You protect him. So what does God say? All that you all that he has is, is yours. You just can't touch his life. And what does the devil do? In like a matter of moments. I mean, can you imagine the fall? <laughs> All of your children, everything that you've owned, just gone, 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 that quick. And just as fast as one man can tell you that everything's gone and destroyed, another man comes and tells you, and I'm the only one left. It's an amazing story. Isn't it? But let's jump in. 32, Job 32. Now all these men are telling Job why he's suffering so much and all this stuff. 32.1, it says, So these three men ceased to answer Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. Ooh. Wait a second. He was righteous in his own eyes. God said all these good things about him, right? Didn't he? <coughs> Let's turn to 38. God's answer. God's answer. Chapter 38. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up thy loins like a man, for I will demand thee, and answer thou me. Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who has stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Can you imagine God speaking to you like this? Job is, he's probably a little shut up, don't you think? I mean, who? Or what, who shut up the sea with doors when it break forth as it issued out of the womb? When I made the clouds the garment thereof and thick darkness a swaddling band for it and break it up for it do. For in my decreed place, and set bars and doors, and said, Hitherto shalt thou come, but no further, and here shall thy proud waves be stayed. Hast thou commanded the morning since the days, and caused the day spring to know his place? 
that it might take hold of the ends of the earth, that the wicked might be shaken out of it? This is an amazing thing that God is telling Job. To think about poor, this poor fellow. He's been through some, some trouble, right? But now you guys know the whole story, so I don't have to go into all of that. Now, if we turn into 40, I want to get into this other character that's brought out now. God, God brings out something else into this, into this story that Job isn't familiar with what's happening. In verse, chapter 40, verse 1, Moreover, the Lord answered Job and said, Shall he that contendeth with the Almighty instruct him? He that reproveth God, let him answer him. Then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer thee? I will lay my hand upon my mouth. Once have I spoken, but I will not answer ye twice. But I will proceed no further. Then answered the Lord unto Job out of the whirlwind and said, Gird up thy loins like a man, and I will demand of thee, and declare unto me, Wilt thou disannul my judgment? Wilt thou condemn me, that thou mayest be righteous? God's setting the tone here. He's setting things straight. He's letting, people, he's letting all these people know in the story what, what's been going on and who they're contending with. Okay? If we turn to 41... Verse 1, can thou draw out Leviathan with a hook or his tongue with a cord which thou letteth down? Do you know who we're talking about here when we say Leviathan? We're talking about Satan. Okay, that'll come clear as we go. I'm going to not read all through all this, but ver jump down to verse 9. Behold, the hope of him is in vain. Shall not one be cast down even at the sight of him? Jumping down to 33. Upon the earth there is not his like, who is made without fear. He beholdeth all high things. He is a king over all the children of pride. Continuing down in 42. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything, and that thou no thought can be withholden from thee. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered that I understood not things too wonderful for me, which I knew not. Here I beseech thee, and I will speak. I will demand of thee, and declare thou unto me. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye has seen thee. Wherefore I abhor myself, and repent in dust and ashes. You think Job's got the right perspective now? Yes. It's a terrible ordeal that he went through. But, but at the end of Job's life, if you continue to read down on there, what does it say that God did for him? He restored way more than he ever had in the end of his life. The Bible says that his daughters were more fair than anybody on the face of the earth. There was none to be found. Everybody came to him and gave him gold, earrings, sheep, goats, whatever. But listen, he went through a horrible, hard time. Why did all that happen? Was it fair? Job didn't think so, did he? This world that we live in, it's crazy. It's nuts. This, this confrontation is going on between good and evil. And we are caught in the middle of it. But don't for a second become high-handed and think that you are righteous. Mm -hmm. And that you do stuff so well. Because here's Job. The Bible says, I mean, God was proud of him. Was he not? Yes. What did he say to the devil? Have you seen this man? But yet, wait a second. There was a problem he had with Job, wasn't there? It's hard to understand. Let's go to Acts. Acts chapter 17. 17 and 26. And hath made of one blood 
all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and have determined the times before appointed and their bounds of their habitation. Sound like something right? We're all of one blood, right? So we're all in the same boat. When you're in a hospital and you're laid up and you've got to give you blood, you're not really concerned with whose blood it was. You just want to make sure it's the right type. Right? Doesn't matter where it came from, who it came from, as long as it's compatible, it's the right type. You're good to go. Right? So no man is any better than any other man. We are all, I don't care who you are, on the same level. Period. Leviticus 17.11. Leviticus 17.11 says that the light is in the blood. You don't even need to turn there. You know that, that scripture, right? That the light is in the blood. Correct? So this blood stuff is pretty important, isn't it? Let's turn to Galatians. Galatians 5.20. The Bible says in Galatians 5.22, but the fruit, does it say fruits? No, it says the fruit, doesn't it? It says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such things there is no law. You see this? When you have the fruit, you don't have one. Follow me? It's not like a gift. You understand that? When you have the fruit, you have all of these. If you look up above that, it talks about the works. And 19, now the works, now there's an S on the works, isn't there? The works of the flesh are made manifest. And these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, and goes on and on. <coughs> it's very important that you understand there's an S there, but there isn't an S on fruit. <laughs> you make the correlation there? Do you understand that? If you have the fruit, you have them all. Don't even consider the other part. You don't even want to be in that group. <laughs> Hang on to the fruit. Right. Matthew 7. Yes, sir. Oh. We need to understand, too, works comes from the flesh. The Spirit offers fruits. Right. The, the, the works are of the flesh. Right. And the, and the Spirit is, is where the our fruits, fruits come the Spirit. from. Absolutely. Um, Matthew 7, 16. Matthew 7.16 You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes or thorns or figs or thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth forth not good fruit is hewed down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Why does it say fruits? Because it's talking about they, right? <laughs> Multiple people. Not everyone, reading in 21, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them that I never knew you. Depart from me that work iniquity. Therefore, in verse 24, whosoever heareth the sayings of mine and doeth them, 
I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house on a rock. Matthew 10, 22. Ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. You see, real fruit, brothers and sisters, attracts bugs. <laughs> you follow me? Real fruit attracts bugs. You can put out those plastic apples and stuff, and you may fool a human being for a second, but you never fool the bugs. <laughs> they don't. Can you grab that for me? Um, there's a story. There's there's a story that um, back in the Vietnam era, there was a fella. Well, we had a church in Saigon. Okay, the Adventists had a church in Saigon, and the Viet Cong were coming in and going to be taking over Saigon. So the Adventist church drew up a short list of the important people that were on the boards of the church. People that, you know, when a new regime comes in, they do away with it. Smart, educated people that are in control of things. Right? They kill them. So they made this short list of uh, people that need to get out of the country. Yeah, just push it back. Yeah. And uh, this one man that was on the board of the church, they forgot to write on the list. He was a very influential man, owned many factories, had a lot of people that worked for him, very rich man. Well, they, the Adventists realized at the last minute that they had forgotten to put this guy on the list. So in the middle of the night comes this, you got to go, we got to go. The Viet Cong are coming. Everything you have, you're going to be killed. <laughs> you need to come with us. Now that man had to make a decision right there, but quick. <coughs> what he could live with and what he could live without. Now, you know, you, you have a lot of things and you have to walk away from them. It could be difficult. <coughs> Brothers and sisters, we are living at the end of time. You may be asked to walk away in this situation. Now remember, the Lord had this, this fella, the, um, and, and by the way, he did leave, and his whole family, and I don't know the whole rest of the story, but they came over here with the clothes on their back, started over. Now the rich young ruler, you remember him from the Bible? He came to Jesus, and the Bible says that Jesus loved him, right? And he says, well, what must I do? He says, go sell all that you have, give to the poor, and follow me. Listen, when you are touched by Jesus, you are never the same. Yes. Amen. You are never the same. This man walked away. He walked away because he couldn't give up all that he had, all these possessions. Do you think he went away a happy man? No, I think he spent the rest of his days very unhappy. But you stop and think about it. Now, Jesus warned the abomination that causes desolation when all Jerusalem was, you know, I mean, they came in there and destroyed everything, right? They burned everything. Crosses stood up everywhere, just crucified everybody. You suppose he was one of them guys? You don't think all his money saved him then, do you? Stop and think of it. You can give it up now and follow Jesus or hang on to it and die anyway. You can't have it. I want to draw a little illustration. And what we're going to talk about is, is imparted and imputed righteousness. Okay? Now, out in the, I'm no drawer. Okay? <laughs> So, forgive me already. Out in the ocean, that's the ocean. <laughs> we'll call it the Gulf, okay? There's people that go and they take oil out of the bottom of the sea, right? But what do they need to do first? 
they need to set piles, don't they? Yes. They drill piles way down in the sea. I told you I'm not a drawer. That's supposed to be four piles. Okay? And it's in the bedrock. So this stuff is doesn't move. Now they build their platform on this great foundation, right? And in this platform, the foundation, the blood, okay, we have imputed, imputed righteousness. You give your heart to Jesus Christ, right? The blood of Christ covers you. You now have a standing. You follow me? A place in which you can do work. Ha! Ah, work. What did it say? We must do things. What, those verses we read? Who's going to be in heaven? Those who do the will of the Father? Hmm. In hearted righteousness is this work that's done on that platform. And can you claim any of that work? That's not your work. That's God's work. Right? It is. He makes it possible for everything. He has laid the foundation for you to work. The blood of Christ covers your sin. You now have a spot, a place to do your work. And he now gives you his imparted righteousness if you allow him to work in your life. Mm -hmm. And then you can really be victorious. Now, Jesus talks about a vine, right? And John, he says, I am the vine, and ye are the branches. Right? Now, this is the vine. This would be Jesus. And these are the branches. Now, you have grapes that grow. I told you I'm no artist. <laughs> grapes that grow on the on the, on the uh, branches. <laughs> but we talk about the ten virgins, right? What about the ten virgins? What's it say in the Bible? Five of them go in, right? But five of them don't. Are these virgins? Are they believers? They're believers, aren't they? Okay? Now, they may have this imputed righteousness. They, they are just like, you see? Because we've got three people here. We've got one that's bearing fruit. We've got two others. Like a dead branch. What's the problem here? Are they allowing God to impart His righteousness? What does God say that he will do with the unfruitful branch? Burn it up. You, you're either going to produce 30, 60, or 90, the Bible says. Right? Look at it. I'm not talking about our own righteousness here. I'm talking about God's righteousness. We have got to allow him this place in our lives. We have got to be so connected to the vine that we're bearing fruit. Amen. If we're connected to the vine, we believe in Christ. Oh, I believe in Christ. Right? I sit in the pew every week, but there's no fruit in my life. What are we doing? Stop and think about that. We're living at the end of time. When your neighbor someday may come and say, you never even spoke to me? You never even told me? Think about this. I'm not talking about us doing work. I'm talking about allowing Jesus to do his work. Just like we talked about in Sabbath school today. If we look at John, John uh, 10, John 10, what is it, John 10? John 14, 10, sorry. Brother and thou, 
Not that I am in the Father and the Father in me. The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. You see, Jesus didn't even claim any righteousness of his own. You follow me? He's asking us to overcome the same way he overcame. The Holy Spirit is what he allowed to do the work. He was the most fruitful of all human beings that ever was and ever will be. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. I'm not here to discourage anybody today, okay? I just want you to realize that you need to be alive. You need to be alive in Jesus Christ. Not just merely an assent that, oh yes, I believe in Jesus. Because it's, it's more than just, I believe in Jesus. You don't, you need more than faith in Jesus. You have to have living inside you the faith of Jesus. Amen. Amen. That is the victory. Let's turn. I'm going to close here real quick. 2 Corinthians. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are in